and welcome everyone. Give me just one moment while I switch to my presentation here. Excellent. So uh, I'll warn you, this is a bit of a new experiment for me. Normal, most of the presentations I've given uh, use Microsoft PowerPoint, but today I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna use uh, Jupyter Notebook so that I can do it both as a presentation and as a live demo. And you'll be able to see that, and as Angela said, it is important that um, you make sure that your Zoom screen uh, is in full screen mode. It'll make it much easier to view all of the content. So uh, the topic today is uh, faster MIPS using custom heuristics. And of course, the most important question is how do you get a copy of this presentation in code? And the answer is stay tuned to the end. So I'd like to hope that you will stay for the entire presentation. And at the very end, uh, I'll give you information how you can get all of this uh, for yourself. So some background about heuristics in MIP. So heuristics are not necessary for MIP. Uh, in general, you know, how is uh, mixed integer programs solved? They're solved through a branch and cut algorithm. You know, you generate some cutting planes that are um, reducing some of the fractional solutions. And then you're taking the fractional variables. And you know, if you have got a variable that's equal to 0.6, that's supposed to be integer, then you do the branching where you try x greater than or equal to 1, x less than or equal to 0. Those are two branches. And you keep solving until you find an integer feasible solution. That will eventually produce uh, the optimal solution if you uh, continue long enough, but heuristics can help make the MIPS faster than just the branch and cut algorithm alone. They uh, can help you find an integer feasible solution without having to dive down into the search tree. They can also help you improve incumbent solutions. So when you have an integer solution, you can apply heuristics to try to improve upon that. And within MIP, you actually can run these heuristics alongside the branch and cut. You could do them at the very beginning. Say, before you even solve the problem, you can run a heuristic to try to generate a feasible solution. You could also run it after the LP relaxation. You might have some information from the LP relaxation, like the, the values from the LP relaxation. But the part we're going to talk most about is running them within the branch and cut tree, because that's a very powerful thing. So for MIP, what are the types of solution heuristics? We're going to talk about construction and improvement uh, heuristics. Construction are they're building, finding a feasible, an integer feasible solution. They're building an integer feasible solution. You know, you might have a model for which it's easy to find an integer solution. There are others that it's very hard. And through those construction heuristics, that'll help you build an integer solution. And as I mentioned earlier, you also have improvement. If you already have an integer feasible solution, you can try to modify that, say by swapping variables or, or changing the variable values to get a better solution. So now why custom heuristics? What's important about custom heuristics? In fact, Groby and other major solvers provide multiple general purpose heuristics that are effective for many MIP models. And here's just a few. There's dozens of them inside of Groby. Um, some of them are well-known. The ones I'll talk about today are well-known. Some are, are uh, proprietary. I can't talk about them, but I'll talk about three that are very well-known that are built into Groby. So the good news is you don't have to do anything. These are already going to do it automatically. So a construction heuristic, here's two. First one is the zero heuristic. And this one sounds funny. This one, all you have to do is try the value x equals zero as a candidate solution. You think, well, that's not necessarily going to be very good. And you're right. But when you combine that with an improvement methods, you could use that initial integer solution and then start applying some improvement methods and turning it into a very good quality. So even that very simple solution, which is very easy to test, very quick to test, x equals zero, can be a very powerful thing. Garobi does this. Other solvers have done this for a long time. So that's something you don't have to implement that. That's, that's already built into the solver. A second one is the zero objective, a little bit more subtle, but and, and, a, and quite a bit more powerful. Uh, normally, you've got your, your optimization problem, maximize CX, subject to AX equals B, and X greater or equal to zero. And if it's a mixer, that's a linear programming problem. If it's a mixed integer linear program, then some of the X's are integer values. With the zero objective, instead of saying maximize CX subject to AX equals B, you now solve a, a, a related problem, maximize zero subject to AX equals B, 
x greater than or equal to zero, some of the x's are, are integer. Well, what's special about that? When you've got the objective of zero, the dual of that problem, the dual values are very easy. Zero is a valid dual solution for that problem, uh, for the LP relaxation, of course. And so it's very easy to solve the, the, the dual simplex method, barrier method, tends to solve that very fast. And so you, this is a, 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 a feature that's built into Garobi. It's turned off by default. You can turn it on by setting the parameter zero objective nodes for the number of nodes you want to run, and it'll do this heuristic. So you don't have to implement this as a very popular and common heuristic that has been done for a long time, and that's already built in. Another built-in heuristic, uh, talk about improvement heuristics, is something called RINs. It's an improvement solution where you fix some variables that are integer and then solve the reduced myth. There's a lot of heuristics of this family. They, some are improvements, some are construction, where basically you say, you know, here's a bunch of variables that are currently integer in my LP relaxation. What if I just fix them at their current integer values and use that to find a solution? And in RINs, basically you're comparing a prior integer solution with your current LP relaxation. You say, oh, well, here was a good in a prior solution and they match up on these variables. So let's fix those and solve that, um, that um, a problem as a way to improve upon that prior um, uh, feasible, integer feasible solution. So those are built in, you don't have to do anything. So what we're gonna talk about is what you can do to better exploit your model specific structure and come up with some extra better heuristics that are better for your model. They won't apply to all models, but they'll be good for this model. So for the rest of the presentation, we're gonna use the traveling salesman problem for the illustration. And I'm gonna emphasize this now and I'm gonna repeat it because this is a very important point. Why am I using the traveling salesman problem? Because it's a very rich model. There's a huge history of it. There's lots and lots of study on it. There's lots of heuristics. We're gonna take a look at some of them and it's very easily to understand. If I were to give, say, a mining application, I'd have to get into all of the jargon of mining. You have to understand that. Where's the traveling salesman problem? I, I think many of you have seen it. You may have even studied it. You may have even done some, some computational experiments yourselves. And so it's something you should be familiar to uh, many people that are attending today. But, and here's the disclaimer, I am not today going to show you the world's fastest way to solve the traveling salesman problem. If your goal is to solve the traveling salesman problem, my recommendation to you is don't use what I'm going to use today. Use a, a very specific application specific code for the traveling salesman problem. There's lots of implementations of this. Some are approximate, some are exact. You know, so the approximate ones are themselves heuristics. They'll be, they'll be you know, close to optimal, but not necessarily optimal. But if you want to solve just a traveling salesman problem, don't use what I'm going to use today. Use a special purpose code, probably the best known, one of the, the top ones for this is something called Concord. When you get a copy of the, um, the Jupyter Notebook that I'm using today, you get a link to it, but you can also just go out on to your favorite search engine and uh, search for Concord TSP solver. I'm going to use the TSP as an inspiration. Could you look, use all these well-known heuristics and show you what it's like to implement them, how easy it is to do that in Garobi, and hopefully that'll inspire you for your own applications. So a quick review. Um, uh, you probably heard of traveling salesman problem. Let's just do a very quick review. What is traveling salesman problem? Today, we're going to look at the symmetric version. By symmetric, we mean that the distances are same from A to B and B to A. So we're going to give an, a symmetric graph with nodes and edges. So nodes are places, points, and edges are the connections. And we have a distance value for each edge. And again, it's symmetric, meaning it distance from A to B is the same as from B to A. What we want to do is find a tour that visits each city exactly once and returns to the starting point. And the optimization part is that we're going to minimize the total distance. So it's very easy in the traveling salesman problem to find a feasible tour. If you have five cities, you can go one, two, three, four, five, and go back to one. That's always going to that's going to be feasible. You know, there are some versions of it where it's sparse. We're not going to look at that today. We're going to look at where there's uh, from every pair of cities there's a direct connection from A to B, A to C, A to D, etc. So here's an example tour on thirty cities. Right now, I'm just showing you some pictures, but later we'll we'll do a live demo. So in this example, here's 30 cities. This is the optimal tour on these 30 cities. 
these cities are arranged on a standard uh, 2D Cartesian coordinate system, and the distances are your standard Euclidean distance, straight line distance. So that's what was used for this example. So here's these 30 cities. The minimum length is 483.52, and that's a picture of it. So what does the MIP model look like for this symmetric traveling salesman problem? We have a data of dij, which represents the distance between nodes i and j. And then we're going to set binary variable xij equal to 1 if edge ij is in the tour. And of course, it's 0 if it's not. So we're going to want to have n of these, one, one edge for each uh, uh, selected for each number of nodes. So if we've got 10 nodes, we're going to have 10 edges. That will be in the optimal solution. And our, our objective function is just simply minimize the dij times xij. So if xij is 1, that means we're selecting the edge. That's just going to sum up the distances that we select. Constraint number 1 is the degree constraint. It says that for every node i, it has two cities that link up to it, something that comes before and something that comes after. It's symmetric, so it could be either direction, but we always have two neighbors for each uh, node in the symmetric version. I'm going to uh, come back to constraint two. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll come back to that one in a moment. That's the most complicated constraint. Let's talk about the third constraint, which is the symmetry constraints. Um, there's lots of ways to handle it. Here, I'm just going to put it in as a constraint, or I could handle it by data, which is just saying is that if I'm going from I to J, it means I'm also going from J to I. In other words, if I go from, from Chicago to Detroit, that means I could also go from Detroit to Chicago. That I could handle this through data. I could handle this through pre-processing. Um, uh, but I'm just going to do that to keep the notation, to keep the code cleaner. So what is constraint number two? Suppose for the moment I didn't have constraint number two uh, in my model. I just had uh, the objective, constraint one, and constraint three. If that happened and I didn't have two, a valid solution to, the, to that model might be one, two, three, four, five, and back to one, and six, seven, eight, nine, and back to six. There's a problem with that. That would have something called two subtours. It would be one going one, two, three, four, five, and back one. And the other one, six, seven, eight, nine, and back to six. That's a problem. That's not a tour visiting all cities. That's just a tour. That's two smaller tours that uh, that visit the cities, but they don't connect together. Those are called sub tours, and we need a constraint or a group of constraints to handle that. One way of doing that is constraint number two, and that basically just says for any subset of nodes that I want to make sure. And that's not the entire set of nodes, but for a subset of nodes, I have to make sure that I'm not, uh, that I'm leaving that subset. I'm not just having the tour entirely contained with that subset. So in other words, this will prevent, if you think about one, two, three, four, five, this means that I can't stay entirely within one, two, three, four, five. At some point, I have to leave that group of one, two, three, four, five to go out to the rest of the nodes. There's a problem, however, with constraint number two. If you're, uh, if you're um, uh, familiar with this, you know this already, and that's, there's a large number of these constraints. Constraint number one is simple. There's only one of those constraints for each of the nodes. So there's N of them. Constraint number three, if you do it as a constraint, you either do it as a constraint or data, it's not too many, it's for every pair of nodes. But constraint number two is a bit of a problem because there's an exponential number of them. And in fact, most of them are not binding. Most of them don't really become a problem for your model. So in practice, what do you do? You could add them to the, law, to the model, but it would create an, uh, an extraordinarily large model. And it's not really necessary. So we're gonna use a feature in the solver called lazy constraints. All that means is that we're not gonna add them at, at, at the beginning, but we're, while we're solving the model, we're going to ask, is any of those uh, constraints, these sub constraints in number two, are, they, are any of them that are currently violated? If so, then we're gonna add it and keep on solving it. And so we're gonna keep asking ourselves, uh, asking the solver in, in the middle, hey, is there any of these sub constraints that are currently violated? If so, add it and then keep on solving. And that way the hope is, is that we don't have to add a lot of them. We're not, hopefully we're not adding an exponential number of them. We're just adding a, a, a smaller group of them, just the ones that are violated as we're solving the model. Now that's the TSP. Let's talk about general MIP. What is the, when you're solving a MIP, 
what is the status of nodes? So the LP could be infeasible, in which case you prune that part of the MIP search, or the LP is feasible. That's the other possibility. But within the LP feasible, you've got a few other um, bits of information. You could be integer feasible, or you could have fractional values. Now, if you've got fractional values, you need to keep on branching. But if you're integer feasible, for the TSP, you've got two possibilities. You might have those subtours, which we were talking about in that case uh, earlier, in which case you're going to need to add some lazy constraints. But if you're integer feasible and you have no subtours, meaning you just have one tour that, that visits all the cities, you found a new tour, it might be an improvement on your prior solution. So what I've indicated in this part is that things that are bold-faced has some value that we can exploit in heuristics. We know there are some subtours, so maybe we could use that information. And if we've got fractional values, maybe we could use that somehow to create heuristics. And that's what we're gonna do for the traveling salesman problem. So let's take a look at some, um, some well-known MIP heuristics. Sorry, let me just make this a fits a little bit better. So the first MIP heuristic, and there's oodles and oodles. There are entire books filled with heuristics for the traveling salesman problem. I'm just gonna give a few for illustration purposes. So the first one I'm going to look at today is a greedy construction heuristic. And the idea with this one is you start with a path in the graph. Of course, you start with no path and you can start by connecting two nodes, but you've got some path and you're gonna add the closest node and you repeat until you visit all the nodes and then you return back to start the tour. So you can say one to two, then, then two to three, three to four, et cetera, and you come back to the, to the start. So here's a picture of that as it's going on. And if you're in the lower right-hand corner, you might want to add that one node that's all the way in the, uh, uh, in the, in the far right, uh, bottom right corner is the next point. And, that, and then you keep on iterating until you visit all the nodes and then come back to the start. So that's a, a greedy construction heuristic. Let's take a look at a second heuristic. Something I'm going to call subtour, sorry, subtour patching. So this uh, is a heuristic where we've got some subtours, and that's why I said earlier, we've got that subtour information. We can try to join subtours together to get a larger subtour, and we repeat until there is just one subtour. So here's a picture of it. So here we've got a bunch of subtours, and in my top left, I've, I'm trying to connect two of them. Uh, apologies if you are uh, colorblind. There is in this picture uh, two arcs that are green that are part of my subtours. If I remove those two green arcs and replace them by the red arcs, I would take those two subtours, the one in the top left that has four nodes and the one adjacent to it with three nodes, the triangle, by removing those two green edges and replacing them with the two new red edges, I would uh, take those two subtours and make one of them. And I could keep applying this again and again until I've got just one tour of all the nodes. So that's a second heuristic. Another heuristic is fix and dive. Now this isn't specific to the traveling salesman problem. This is something you would apply in any mixed integer programming problem. And I'll talk about what's special about this for the traveling salesman problem in a few minutes. So fix and dive, we take a, a solution that's a current relaxation and we look at the variables that might be integer. So in our traveling salesman problem, these are variables that are equal to one. And so we would say, we're gonna fix that and solve the reduced MIP. And so, oops, here we go. Here's a picture of this. And in this picture, you see there are some arcs that might be currently fixed at one. And so we could just fix those and solve a second MIP where those values are fixed at one. And the second MIP is much smaller it has fewer variables, has fewer constraints, and so hopefully we can solve that much faster. Of course, it's not, that may not be optimal, but it will give us a feasible solution, and then we could apply that again and again. One more heuristic is swap. There's oodles and oodles of swap heuristics for the traveling salesman problem. Here's a simple one where we swap two edges in a tour. So we've got a tour. This is a valid tour, but if you look at the, um, the two red edges, they cross over each other. And that's not so efficient. If we remove those two red edges and replace them by the two green edges, we will get a shorter tour. And so we could just apply this time and time again and see what kinds of improvements we've got. And there's lots of swap uh, heuristics 
they're often called two up, three up, four up. You can keep applying it again and again to try to improve upon your solution. So that's just a few heuristics. There are far more. I don't consider myself to be an expert in the traveling salesman problem. I certainly know quite a bit about it. But as I said earlier, if you're specifically interested in the traveling salesman problem, there are some great books, including uh, two by Bill Cook that uh, uh, cover a lot of, of, of uh, a theory and practice about the traveling salesman problem. There's a bunch of great presentations online that you can view that uh, some of them cover exact methods, but a lot of them cover these types of heuristics. And some of these heuristics, there's proofs on how, um, how, how good they are in terms of solution quality, how fast they are. There's lots of good information. But so these are a few interesting heuristics that we're going to try. So let's now, that's it for my uh, uh, introduction information. Let's take a look at the model code. And I have to warn you, my model code, I wrote it in kind of a, a funny way, funny, strange. Um, I'm going to say it's pedantic because it's going to be a research test bed where I can try different heuristics. I wanted to make my code written in such a way that I could plug and play various different heuristics. I didn't have to completely rewrite all of my code just to try a new heuristic. If you already know what kind of heuristics you want to apply, you could write much simpler code. Um, and uh, you, you don't need quite the, as much machinery as I'm going to, I'm going to show. Um, so um, I'm going to do this in Python, but everything I'm going to show you, you could do with any of the Gorobi object-oriented programming languages or in the C API. So if you want to do this C++ or in Java or C Sharp, you could definitely do this. Um, so I'm just going to use Python because I love Python. I'm a big fan of Python. It's easy. It, the code is simple. And I get some nice graphical tools for it. So first, I need some code to create the base model. So here's a function that's going to create the model. I've, I import some libraries, and I've got number of, uh, uh, number of cities and, and my distance values. And uh, I'm going to have a time limit. I'm not going to let it run forever because we only have an hour together for this presentation. So I'm going to set up some data. I'm now going to create my variables. So I've got a variable for each one of my distance values. And that those are binary variables representing, do I select this? Um, this edge from the graph. So one means I select it, zero means I'm not going to select it. And here's what I'm going to do about this symmetry issue, the I to J, J to I. I'm going to handle it, although Python doesn't call these pointers, think of these as pointers that basically I'm just going to say, I'm not creating a new variable. I'm creating a pointer to that variable saying that for, uh, if, if, I, if I've got a variable from one to three, then I'll just say that the variable three, one just points back to that original variable one to three. So here's my degree two constraint saying that for each node, I have to have two nodes adjacent to it. So I just sum up over the, all of the uh, variables that are adjacent to it, that must be equal to two. I need to say, I'm gonna do these lazy constraints, which we talked about earlier. And I'm actually gonna solve this um, to the exact amount. I do, uh, normally with MIP, you solve it to a MIP gap tolerance. I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna solve it exactly. So I'm going to solve it uh, exactly. And what do I do to, to, to deal with that? I say it's exact up to the, the smallest difference in, um, in distance values. Because I know if I'm, if I'm below that smallest distance, you know, if, I've, if, my, if I've got my distances and say they're 100, 102, 150, 160, I know that, if I, that 102 minus 100 is my smallest difference. So all I have to do is solve the problem up to a MIP gap of two. And I know that if I'm below two, I'm optimal. So that's what I'm going to do here. And that's my, that's my model, except for the subtours. So what do I do about these subtours? So first, I want to find them. So I run a little function here that finds the subtours. So what does this do? Let's talk about this is that it's the main part of this is that it traces through all of the edges. And in Python, all I have to do is I just check and see if this list, think of it like a set, if this list of edges is non-empty, then I'll pull one of the edges out of it. And then I just start tracing the cycle. I find the successor and the next successor and the next successor until I come back to the my starting point. And I add that to my list of cycles. And of course, once I've done that, then I remove the edges from my list of unexplored edges. And then I just keep iterating until I have visited all of the edges. And that gives me my set of cycles. And I do one last thing here. 
And if any of you have already looked at the sample code that we provide with the solver, you'll know we do provide a traveling salesman problem sample. But my presentation today, I'm going to, this is my first um, sort of change in the logic. Um, in the sample that we uh, that you find that installs alongside Garobi, it only finds one of these traveling salesman um, uh, sub tours. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually find all of them. And I'm actually going to sort them from smallest to largest. Um, and again, this is very easy to do in Python. I just use the sorted function. I just say I'm sorting it according to the length of that list. So that gives me, say, if I have a, a sub tour of one, two, three, another one, four, five, six, seven, and another one that goes eight to 20, then I would be in that order with the shortest sub tour and the next uh, shortest. And the reason that I'm going to do that is that. In that same example, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, those two sub tours, if I get those, I don't actually have to add the last constraint, the eight through 13, or eight through 20, because that one's actually implied by the other two. And like, it makes my model a little bit more efficient. So let's create that function. I've got a little helper function that just, that just creates the sum of a, of a tour cost, not totally necessary. So here's my callback function. Now my callback function, remember I said, this is going to be a bit more complicated uh, because I wanna make this a test bench where I could plug and play different heuristics. Again, most people, researchers are gonna do something like this, but most um, applications, once you know the heuristic you like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to write it quite as complicated or as fancy as what I've done. So what I've done here is I've written it using a, a closure. And that's a fancy way of for saying a function that generates a function. It's a function factory. It's actually going to um, uh, uh, create the uh, functions itself. Itself. And so the subtour function is actually going to do a bunch of, of heavy lifting for me. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to find uh, uh, this callback function is going to find my subtours, and it's actually going to collect them. So the first thing it's going to do is it's it's checking if there's a new MIP solution. It's going to call that subtour function, and it's going to do one of two things. If there's more than one subtour, if there's more than one tour, then I've got subtours. I'm going to collect them. Otherwise, I found a new tour, and so I'm going to collect that too. And I'm going to check because hey, I found a solution, and it, it's not just an integer solution; it's actually valid for my traveling salesman problem. It's it's it has just a single tour, so that way I want to I want to even check that time. So I can report on that. Here's the, the fancy part of the closure. This is where I'm going to call that, that sub function, which is the heuristics. And then I'm now going to add the sub tour constraints. So I've highlighted this code. And so if I'm um, doing the, if I found, if I have any collected sub tours, then I'm just going to add the sub tour constraints. And so I say for each combination of nodes in that tour, I'm going to add the constraint for that sub tour constraint. And then the last part is, hey, what if I found a tour either you know, through, through a heuristic or something, I want to collect, I've, I've now collected some, some tour and I want to tell Garobi I found a new integer solution and, that, uh, and to, to evaluate that inside of the MIP. And so uh, says, well, wait, um, what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to actually take the, the, the best cost of these tours I've, I've done. This isn't strictly necessary. You could apply all of them, but this is a nice little thing that's going to make things quite a bit faster. Trust me, I did benchmark this and test this myself. So it is, if you found multiple ones, just take the one that has your best objective rather than telling Garobi, well, here's one and here's another one, here's another one. Just give the one that has the best objective and only bother to apply it if it's an improvement. You don't have to do this. This is optional, but it does make things run faster. Uh, the main part that you need to focus in on is basically what I'm going to do here, this line that I've highlighted here. If I found a tour, then I iterate through that tour and say that I want to make those variables equal to one as a set. I'm going to set that solution in the solver. All the other stuff is just basically a little bit of extra sugar to make it run faster. 
This, for example, I'm setting all the variables equal to zero. It just suppresses some warnings. You don't have to uh, set the, the remaining variables equal to zero, but you'll get a warning. It'll say, oh, okay, because you didn't, you supplied a partial solution, the solver's figuring out that the other variables must be some other value and it's computing them itself. I just wanted to make the output cleaner. So I, I and it doesn't really make anything, anything any slower to do that. So I just do that to tell the solver to, to use the solution, et cetera. So this is a little bit complicated, but it basically is do, it's, it's checking for a subtour, it's calling my, my heuristic function if I've got one, it's generating the subtour uh, constraints, and if you had any heuristic solutions, it's then setting them into the bit. Finally, I've got a little function that just checks the solution, it checks is it optimal, and it's gonna do a plot. So let us now actually take a look at some real data. So I'm going to solve a model with 300 cities, and I'm going to generate data randomly. So they're going to be random on a um, two-dimensional Euclidean plane, and I'm just going to use the standard uh, a, a two-dimensional two Cartesian coordinate system and use the standard Euclidean shortest distance between two points. And I've got a little function to correct, collect my runtime so we could do some reporting afterwards. I'm not going to go into the details of that. You can read that on your own. So now let's get into the interesting part. Let's actually start solving some models. So we've got 300 cities. My points were generated randomly on a, uh, a 2D grid. And I want to solve this without any heuristics, just using the solver plus this lazy constraint. So let's now solve this. So I'm solving this now as in the middle of the um, presentation. And you'll notice right now, we've got a bound of 1284, but we have no integer solution. We haven't found an integer solution. So we'll wait a little bit longer. And we've, well, it's going pretty quickly. We've gone through 2,500 nodes and we're still finding, and now we found an integer feasible solution through branch and bound. So that's, uh, giving us a MIP gap of 13.3%. We've got a better one here. Now it's down to 14.34, We've uh, uh, over 30 seconds. And I've got a 60 second time limit. So watch this and here's an, an additional better solution, 14.12. But we still have a fairly large um, MIP gap of over 5% right now. We're getting close to that one minute time limit that I put in. Ah, we got better but we should be about time. Yep, we reached the time limit. So we've got a pretty good solution with a MIP gap of 1.23. That solution has value of um, 1,326, but we don't know, is that optimal? Is that suboptimal? Is, this, is the optimal 1310? Is it between 1310 and 1326? We don't know, but here's our solution plotted out. Um, on our 300 cities. It's suboptimal, but it's, it's not too far from optimal. It's about 1% MIP gap. But, you know, looking at that eyeballing, it's hard to tell. You know, I, I, I don't think you could, uh, with, with your eye, uh, I, I certainly could uh, uh, see if there's a better uh, solution lurking in there. So let's now start talking about heuristics. So the first thing I'm going to do, oops, sorry, I hit the, um, run again, we'll let that run in the background while we, um, no harm, we'll let that run in the background while we talk about heuristics. So there, we, we talked about the greedy heuristic, a subtour heuristic, swapping heuristic, we also talked about a fix and dot heuristic. I'm gonna use a, um, a Python class that just lets me compute out heuristics to the traveling salesman problem. I'm just calling my class Python TSP, Py TSP. And I just run it as a class so that I could collect uh, basic things like the number of cities, the distance values, if I want to do some logging. And so I've got my three heuristics here, my greedy heuristic. And it just says, I'm going to take my distance values and they say, well, if I haven't, if I've got unexplored nodes, then I'm going to find my next. Um, uh, my, my cheapest node, my cheapest neighbor node to my current node. That's my best one. I'm going to append that into my tour, remove it from the unexplored nodes and keep going until I found it. 
So in other words, I just, I start with my last, my latest node. I found the next one that's, that's closest to it. I keep going and going. That's my greedy heuristic. The patching, the one that's combining subtours, you take your set of subtours, which will be a Python list of lists, and as and we're going to apply it iteratively as long as we have more than one tour. In, in other words, multiple subtours. I'm going to take one of them, and this is a bit tricky code to read, but basically what this is is finding two things. Number one is finding uh, the the second subtour to combine, and is finding what points do you sort of cut and paste the subtours together. And when you do that, you can also do it in a forwards direction or reverse direction. So that's all it's doing. It's just saying, here's one subtour. Now let's find the second one that the best match for it, along with the points that I want to match for it. Once I do, then I'm going to collect a new tour that's going to be basically T1 up to point K1, then T2 uh, from some, some points, and then finish out with K T1. So we've got a forward or reverse version of this, and we keep patching that until we get a single subtour. And finally, I've got a swap heuristic. Again, this case, I'm just doing a two-opt heuristic. There's lots and lots of different swap heuristics you can do. In this case, um, I'm just going to say I'm going to pick a point, another point, and check if this is going to be better to swap, then I'm just going to swap them in um, from J1 to J2, and then back to J uh, at, at some swap point, and then keep moving. And I'm going to replete, I'm going to apply this for each pair of nodes in my tour, but you can reply this, you know, many, many times. There's lots of things you could do uh, with swap heuristics. So let's try that swap heuristic with our MIP. So what we need to do is we need to now write that um, additional callback function. We're going to say, all we want to do is use our previous callback function that was generating, that was checking for solutions, that was um, that the that previous callback function was generating the sub it was finding sub tours and adding the sub tour elimination constraints. We're now going to add an additional um, function into it, which is going to be our swap heuristic. All we're going to do with the swap heuristic is, if we've got a solution. Then we're going for each solution that we found. We're going to apply the swap heuristic and see and try to improve upon it. That's all we have to do, which is very nice because I wrote that modular code for our callback function. Yep, I've already read that in. So now all I have to do is I use my modular code. I just say I've got a bunch of tours. Let's apply the swap heuristic to my existing tours. All right, and let's now solve this same traveling salesman problem that we did earlier. Now, of course, if you think about it, the swap heuristic is an improvement heuristic. It's not going to find new solutions. So we still have the problem that we had earlier. It was we had to wait a while until we got that first solution. But hopefully, once we get that first solution, the swap heuristic should give us better solutions. And why does that matter? Because if we're finding better solutions, and hopefully we're going to cut off a lot of the tree. And there we go. We actually found that first solution. And very quickly, we improved upon it. From we, we got that MIP gap almost by half, almost instantaneously. And remember earlier, when we didn't have the custom heuristics, we didn't solve it to optimality within our 60-second time limit. So we've improved a bit. We're still a little bit stuck at 3%. Oh, but we've improved a lot more. And we're less than the percent. And in fact, we're optimal. We, in fact, found the optimal solution just by adding the um, swap heuristic. It turns out the optimal solution has an objective of 1,314 life. And here's the plot of it. And so we were able to solve that by just simply taking the standard uh, branching and cut for um, the traveling salesman problem with the subtour constraints. But every time we find a solution from branch and cut, we apply a very simple swap heuristic. And that just gave us just the little boost we needed to solve that uh, model to optimality within 60 seconds. Well, let's try another heuristic. Let's try the greedy heuristic. Now, most people, when they apply the greedy heuristic, you know, when you read about it, you apply that greedy heuristic with the distance values. But here's where things get very interesting. There's nothing special about the distance values. We can, in fact, use the 
values from the LP relaxation. You know, wow, because the LP relaxation, at some point, you're going to have some values that are going to be one, and some might be 0.8. And you, so what you're thinking is, well, if that value in the relaxation has a value of one, that means it's probably a, a good candidate to be in the solution. If it's 0.8, it's almost as good of a candidate as the variables with one uh, with that are at one. If the value is at 0.1, that's something you should think about. If the values are at zero, then they're probably not going to be very good candidates. So we're not going to use the actual distances. We're going to use instead the distances that are the distance values we're going to use are the values that we obtain from solving the LP relaxation. But there's a catch. Normally in the TSP, you're solving it to minimize the distance, the total travel distance. Here, you want to go in the opposite direction. You actually want to be towards the values that are, that are one. You actually want to maximize it. So that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to do that through the sense value. So I'm going to take my greedy callback and I'm going to call it with the values from the X values from the relaxation. But there's one other tweak we could do. And this was actually, I, I'm not going to demonstrate why you need this tweak. Um, if you will, like, when you get the code, you're welcome to, to, to test the code yourself and see why this is helpful. I would do one other tweak to that. There's going to be a lot of times we've got variables that are all tied at zero. Well, if that's the case, um, why don't we break those ties by going back to our original distance values? And we're basically going to take them the negative distance values because remember, we're maximizing. So we want the short distances. And so the reason that we're, what we're going to do here is that if the variables are at zero, we're going to go back and use the original distance values, although the negative value of that. So well, why does that matter? Because if we didn't do this, we're going to wind up with a bunch of subtours. And OK, while the greedy heuristic will break them, if you don't break that tie somehow, it might be pulling out an edge that's very expensive. So in fact, what we're doing is basically, once you get a greedy tour that winds up looking like a sub tour, it's not gonna really be a sub tour because the greedy heuristic will never loop back to itself, but you, know, you sort of run out of, of good things that are connected. So you say, well, what's the next best thing to take? Go back and use the original distance value. It turns out this is very, very, very helpful. So let's now solve it. Again, what's nice is that I've got this modular code where I could plug and play a new heuristic. So now I'm going to plug in this, um, this new heuristic where I'm taking these relaxed values, x, and then uh, I'm just going to apply my, uh, my pi TSP class and I'm going to run the greedy algorithm using my x values. So let's try this. So one thing you notice immediately is that the, uh, this greedy heuristic finds a solution very quickly, which is what we expect. It's always easy to find some tour to our traveling salesman problem. And the greedy heuristic is, is a good way for doing that. So in fact, you know, as soon as we call, the first time we call the greedy heuristic, it finds a solution, which is pretty nice. So of waiting 20 some odd seconds, we now get that solution pretty quickly. But now it looks like we're a little stuck. We've got pretty good solutions, but we still, we're a little bit stuck with a MIP gap of 8.87%, and we're not seeing much improvement. And part of what's going on is that we're calling this greedy heuristic at every single time we've got a fractional value. And while it's a relatively cheap heuristic to call, if you're basically calling it every time you solve an LP relaxation, it's slowing down our work. Um, and so we solve and we're suboptimal. And if you look at this picture, uh, so we're suboptimal. Our length is 1,433. If you remember, the optimal solution had a solution, a length of 1,314. So we're over uh, 100 units of, of, of distance, almost 10%. Yeah, we saw that. It was 8% or something off the, uh, of a MIP gap. And you could even look at this picture and see, well, of course, that's a, that's a, a bad tour because you can see a bunch of places where it's crossing over. As we'll come back to that a little bit later. So it gave us a quick solution, but we, 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 not, we lost our ability to converge. So let's try a third heuristic. Let's try our patch heuristic. So the patch heuristic just basically says, if we've got subtours, let's apply the patch heuristic to them. And that will give us new tours 
thanks to our patch heuristic. We're going to apply this every time we've got some tweaks. So again, a very nice, I wrote this function in a very funny way to make it very modular to plug and play a bunch of different heuristics. So let's now call this uh, solve with the patch heuristic. Again, the patch heuristic is a construction heuristic. So we're finding a solution pretty quickly. So now we're actually better than we were at the close of our, um, our greedy heuristic and, and faster than I can scroll. It's just lots of information. And in less than 18 seconds, we are actually optimal. The patch heuristic is very, very good for this problem. We're optimal very, very quickly. So now let's try the fix and dive heuristic. So the fix and dive heuristic is, now this is a little funny. Fix and dive heuristics are not new. They're, they're a very old idea, which says, and many of you have probably tried this. You know, you say, well, these are variables I think need to be one. And so let's try solving a simpler model where I fix them at one and solve that smaller model. Well, the way that these run when they run automatically within a MIP is that you say, well, here's my LP relaxation. And in my LP relaxation, I have a bunch of variables that are currently at one. So let's try to fix those, solve that model, and then see if there's a solution and then continue on. And later when we get to a, another uh, um, fractional solution, let's try it again. Now, um, the callback gets a little bit funny. So, so the first thing you think of is, that's a great heuristic. Why doesn't Garobi do it as sort of a built-in feature? And the answer is, yeah, we do that. But there's a really complicated catch to it. When Garobi does that, it does that just generally in terms of MIP. It doesn't know about the subtour constraints. So while it does have the ability to do a, a fix and dive heuristic, and that is a, a built-in feature. So, you know, uh, important message here. Normally, you're not going to implement your own fix and dive heuristic. You're going to rely, you, you don't need to do this for most applications because the solver does it automatically. But here we need to do it for the traveling salesman problem because we want to be able, when we're doing fix and dive, to also run the subtour constraints generation within the um, that, that, that fixed MIP. So what we're going to do here, this is just, and I'm going to go a little quickly uh, in the interest of time, but what we're doing here is basically taking our, our, our main model, the outer model, and that when we find a, a, um, a node for it, we're basically going to go to our fixed model and say, hey, take all the variables that are currently one and fix them to one in your fixed model and then solve. Okay, so now we're going to solve the fixed model. And then if we if the uh, fixed model returns a solution, that's a new feasible solution for our main model. Now we have to have actually two copies of the model. So we modify our code just slightly. So we have to, we have created two copies of the model. And so now we're going to solve it. So again, this is a little bit complicated and subtle, but what we're doing is that we're solving this model where we're going to be fixing a bunch of variables. And then that itself is a TSP where we have to apply the subtour elimination constraint. So we've solved it for about 10, 15 seconds, and it's not looking too good because we have no feasible solution. And it's taking a lot of time per node. So we're almost halfway done with our solve and we've yet to find a feasible solution and the nodes are moving very slowly. So we'll give this a little bit more time to see if we get lucky. But not much is happening. So while I'll let that finish, we sort of think about why, what might be happening. Well, there's a way we can improve upon this. Remember, this submodel is solving a traveling salesman problem, and it might be finding subtours. If it's finding subtours, those are not just subtours for the submodel, for that fixed model. They're also subtours for the master model. And you can, you can imagine this because you've got this fractional solution that really is guiding it towards subtours. So maybe what we could do is use that as information to quicker faster generate those subtour constraints back to the master model, 
you know, not just for the sub model. So we're going to share that information from the sub model back to the master model and hopefully do things a little bit better. So maybe that'll fix the problem here. So this is pretty easy to change. What I do is basically I'm going to create one more function, which is going to pass the fixed subtours back to the parent model. And that's this line of code. Basically, if the, if the model finds subtours, send them back to the parent. So this is a little complicated. <laughs> if, if you start to look at this, we've got our original callback, which itself is calling our fixed model callback. And that callback is calling yet another function. So we've got like a closure with a closure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a bit of recursion here. I know the code gets a little complicated and quite abstract. But really, what we're, the concept isn't too hard. We're solving that fixed model. And when we've got uh, information from that fixed model, we want to send it back to the original model, not just solution information, but also the subtour uh, information. So let's try that. Hopefully, this will do better. Now, remember, we let it run earlier for 60 seconds. And we didn't do any, we didn't get any progress. We had very slow progress. We didn't find an integer feasible solution. So we're about a quarter of the way done. Still no, no luck. So this should be better. You know, sort of the intuition says this should be better because we're using that information that we learned from the sub problem and sending it back to the master problem uh, as quickly as possible. But what I think is happening. And if you look at the note counts, remember earlier we were taking like one, 2,000 notes to solve this particular uh, test data. And right now we're almost out of our, uh, our 60 second time limit and we've yet to even reach 100 nodes. What I believe is happening is that while, you know, theoretically this, is, this will work, um, it, it's taking a lot of time because we're, we're basically within our MIP, we're solving another MIP. And the time to solve that MIP is so much that basically it's, it's, it's a classic trade-off. Do you want to do a lot of cheap steps or a fewer steps that uh, you hope will be more powerful, but those fewer steps are going to be very expensive? So in fact, this wasn't very useful. But we can come back to our earlier heuristics. We can try combination. You know, remember the greedy had that crossover. Then it was, you know, the paths were sort of looping over each other. And that's good, that a good way to fix that is by applying the um, swap heuristic. Remember, the greedy heuristic on its own found a solution quickly, but it, was, it never got to optimality. It was kind of stuck at about 8%. So now if we tie greedy plus swapping, we're much better. We're well below that 8% that we were at earlier by just adding the swaps into the greedy heuristic. So that's pretty good. We're close to optimal, less than a percent, but it's kind of slowly getting there. We're, we're, we're like, we're so close and yet we're not quite there. And we're halfway done and we're close, but still not there. So it was helpful, a big help, but we're a little stuck still. Remember the optimal solution is 1,314. So we're, we're not there in either sense. The bound isn't there at 1314 and the incumbent isn't there. So we've got, we're, we're not quite there. We're a lot better than we were earlier, but we're still not quite there. And we're out of our 60 seconds. We're gonna hit that time. So that's pretty good. I mean, a MIP gap of 0.2 for a lot of applications, 0.2% rather, is uh, very, very good, but um, it's not optimal. Well, the patch heuristic worked great. Let's try adding the patch heuristic with the swap heuristic. So you could try that one, let that one run. And it's pretty close. Uh, there we go. And now we're optimal. And we could try patch plus greedy plus swap. You know, why not try them all? We know fix and dive wasn't doing too well, but we could try these other more naive heuristics. You know, maybe uh, more help is helpful. Let's let that run. So we're getting close, but not quite there.
So I will say, while we wait for that to finish, I had a problem with the next part. Um, in yesterday's presentation. So I made a slight tweak to my code. Hopefully that'll work better. Because what I'm going to do after this one finishes, I'm going to show a bar chart of the run times. So uh, uh, hopefully that works better because of a slight improvement I made to my code. So you'll benefit from coming to uh, the uh, second session. Well, we're not quite optimal and we're going to be out of time in just a moment. Yep, we're going to be out of time. All right, so let's hope that all of this works. And it does. Yay. So in this chart, you have two, uh, you have two different bars. The blue represents time to optimality, and the red represents the time to the first solution. And remember, we have a 60-second time limit, and sometimes it, it takes a little bit of time for it to, to recognize the time limit. So if the no heuristics, the first bar, the no custom heuristics, <clears throat> it takes about uh, a little bit over 28 seconds to, solve, to find the first solution, and it doesn't solve to optimality. The swap got us to optimality, but it still took almost a minute. The greedy heuristic got us a solution very quickly, the red bar, but um, it didn't get us to optimality. But I love the patch heuristic. The patch heuristic got us a first solution almost as quickly as greedy, but it got us the optimal solution faster than defaults got us to a feasible solution. So that to me is, is fantastic. We got optimal faster than defaults got us our first feasible solution. The combinations, they weren't great. They weren't terrible, but they weren't great. So the clear winner here was the patch heuristic. Well, one last demo for you. You know, a lot of traveling salesman problems um, you know, are done on, on, you know, standard, you know, geometric ideas. You've got the uh, uh, points on the plane, you've got the standard, you know, shortest uh, straight line distance, the, the Euclidean distance function. But in fact, and that, that's kind of nece uh, necessary for a lot, of, um, a lot of the heuristics, but it's not necessary for um, MIP. For MIP, we could have any distance function. We could have airfares as a distance function. And we don't even have to obey the triangle inequality. Uh, you know, the triangle inequality, uh, just as a reminder, says that um, if you go from A to B, it should never be worse than going A to, A to C to B. In other words, if you put an intermediate city, it should always be at least as long as the direct route. Well, that's not necessary for a MIP. So let's try the MIP, which is pure random data. So pure random, no triangle inequality, no geometric values with, sorry, with our patch callback and it solves to optimality in an, about four seconds. I can't show you a chart because it's no longer uh, lends, lends itself to a nice graph. So we've got, let's, let's see what conclusions we could make. We've, all of this time we've talked about traveling salesman problem. Let's try to extrapolate out uh, and conclude out what we could do for other applications, for other MIPs. What are models that are likely to benefit from these types of custom MIP heuristics? Where it's difficult to find the integer solution via the LP relaxation. We saw that here. The nice thing about that greedy heuristic and about the, um, the subtour patching heuristic was that they gave us integer feasible solutions that were valid tours very, very quickly. It's also very easy to construct or improve a an integer solution. So by contrast, what are models that aren't going to benefit from custom heuristics? If it's very easy to find an integer feasible solution, Gorobi already has a built-in heuristic to generate those, like that zero objective nodes. Um, also, you know, uh, the default heuristics, like knapsack problems, are very easy to find feasible solutions. You don't need to create a custom heuristic because the default heuristics in Gorobi will already do well for them. So some example models. Um, some, I'm going to say some possibility and very promising. So some possibility might be things like set covering and set packing. There, are, of course, are rounding heuristics inside of solvers like Garobi. You know, for a set packing, just take anything that is fractional and just make it zero. That's a rounding heuristic. That will be a feasible solution to a set packing problem. Can you do better than that with some maybe swap heuristics? Yeah, you might be able to. And um, so that has some possibility. But 
Um, areas that I think are particularly promising to use the ideas we talked about today are models with disjunctive constraints, sequencing models or disjunctive scheduling. These are models where you say like, you know, I have a machine and I'm going to either do task A before B or B before A, but I can't do them at the same time. They both need this, this uh, machine. And the problem is for the MIP models for these, um, very often they just take and they say, do them both at the same time, each of them a half. And so they wind up just smearing all of the, the activities one over N in the LP relaxation. And, but it's very easy to break these up and just sequence them in some way, just like we sequence the nodes in the traveling salesman problem. 2D and 3D bin packing. These are where you're trying to arrange things, uh, you know, think of, of arranging things on uh, tiles or arranging objects inside of a truck uh, that are your boxes that you're packing. Um, again, it's, it's very easy to find a feasible solution. Um, but the LP relaxations oftentimes just put everything with one over N, they just spread them all. Uh, and that's uh, not necessarily gonna lead to a, an integer feasible solution. And open pit mining, these are, are uh, very application specific constraints, which basically says you can't take this lower part until you've taken out the part above it. So they have a relationship, a, a sequence constraint of its own. Again, I'm gonna, I said this in the beginning, but I'm gonna repeat it. Please, you know, the example I use today is not to, intended to show you the, the fastest way of solving the traveling salesman problem. If your goal in life is to solve the traveling salesman problem, I want you to, to don't use Garobi, use um, application specific code for the traveling salesman problem. But if you've got a, an application uh, traveling, if you've got a vehicle routing problem, if you've got a bunch of time windows and side constraints, other stuff, you're not solving a traveling salesman problem, you're solving a bit. Why did I use the traveling salesman problem? Because it was easy to understand. If I had given you, say, open pit mining, I would have had to explain a whole bunch of jargon about mining applications. And uh, maybe some of you wouldn't have, uh, you know, I would have lost a lot of you in the audience. Um, so this was a very easy for model to understand and easy to get. So finally, I teased you at the beginning. How do you get this code? The answer is, Everything I showed you today is available for download right now on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash garobi slash presentation prez slash mip here, you can get a copy of this right now. I will warn you though, the sample data is a little too large to run with a free trial license. So you should do one of the following. Commercial prospects, please contact Garobi sales and they can get you a time limited license that will let you run the full models that I've done today. Academic users, Please go to the Gorobi website to get your free academic license. You can get as many as you want. I just put in parentheses if you qualify. I just mean that um, you can't tell us that you once went to school 10 years ago and uh, you get a free Gorobi license. No, it's uh, for people that are current students, current faculty, current staff. Um, if you're a current student, faculty, or staff, then please go to the Gorobi website, get your free academic license. And of course, anyone, you can always use the free trial version. You're just going to have to run it with smaller models, uh, but those aren't quite as interesting. So that's it for my presentation for today.